again I say good morning. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for braving the cold. It's not my favorite thing. That's why I moved south to get away from it. Well, I know, I know. With it, uh, a couple of days, we're going to be back up in the 60s. God is good all the time. <laughs> no, it is. This is that time of year and uh, when weather just happens to be like this. So thank you for getting out this morning. I know that there are several people that have uh, been suffering with illness this past week and we are missing them today. But you're here and uh, God is everywhere. He's here with us, and He's there with them. And it's a good day. As, uh, as the Scripture that was read said, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And last week we began our study on the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 through 7. And at the beginning, God, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, when He sat down to, to teach, He began to share the introduction to what he's going to say. The blessed life. You are blessed if you want a blessed life. This is what it's going to look like. You are are blessed if you are poor in spirit. You are blessed if you uh, uh, mourn. You are blessed if you uh, uh, are are meek. You are blessed if you hunger and thirst after righteousness. He, He lists these things that we are blessed. And then he begins, when he gets into the meat of his sermon, to begin to to tell us everything that we must do in obedience to Him that will help us achieve this blessed life. Everything must be kept in context. we got to know, we can't just pull out a Scripture and say, this is what God is saying because Jesus Christ, He said, blessed are you if you are this way. Now here is how it is. And the very first thing that He gets into is... Uh, he begins to talk about the value of people. And we don't really always know what value is. We don't understand our own value, much less the value of others. Uh, in uh, 2006, I want to get the names right, in Nashville, Tennessee, there was a man by the name of Michael Sparks that walked into a, uh, uh, a thrift store and he saw this old yellowed document that had been shellacked and it was, it was rolled up. He, he saw it there and he looked at it, so he asked the clerk, what are you asking for this? And the clerk says, $2.48. He bought it and took it home. And he opened it up and it was the uh, Constitution of the United States of America. And he got to looking at it and got to researching it and he found out that this document that he bought for $2.48 was one of 200 official prints that were commissioned by John Quincy Adams in 1820. He spent the next year uh, uh, researching and uh, restoring and preserving this document till he got it to the point that he put it up for auction and it sold for $477,000. Now you got to know that if it was a thrift store, somebody gave it away. Somebody didn't know the value. And the rest of the story is that there was a man by the name of, let's, let's, let me get this right here, Stan Caffey. Now, Stan Caffey was a pack rat, and he bought a lot of things. And, uh, and when the story came out in the Nashville, Tennessean, that this is what that this had sold for that and where the guy had bought it, he contacted the reporter and says, I'm the one that gave it to the thrift store. I bought it ten years ago at a yard sale. Someone else didn't see the value of it either. He said, I bought it ten years ago at a yard sale and I had it hanging in my garage. Well, I got married and my wife and I combining our households, we had to clean the garage. And so we, we sold what had value. We uh, threw away what had no value. And while we couldn't sell, we gave away. 
said, we talked about this document, about whether or not we should keep it. My wife said, get rid of it. So we did. But I don't have any hard feelings about this man. I am happy for him because the truth is, if I still had it, it would still be hanging in my garage. For you see, there is value that we don't see because all we can see is outside. But Jesus Christ begins to talk to us about our value if we lead a blessed life as we continue there in chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. I'll be reading in King James. I love the NLT. That's probably my favorite. But there's some scriptures that's just got to be King James. And for me, this is one of them. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that is there in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Father, your word, we thank you for it. We ask your blessings on it, that it will teach us and will change our lives forever. Now, I said that Jesus began by talking about our value. What in the world does salt have to do with value? Now, not only when we try to keep things in context, that this whole sermon, everything that is in verse 1 of 5 all the way through the end of 7, one sermon, everything must be compared to each other to find the truth. That is uh, why we talk about the context. If we pull it out of context, we can get lost. But we also have to keep it in the context of history because when Jesus was talking to these people, they knew what he was talking about. Now we say you are the salt of the earth. We see salt as common table salt. That's what, unless you're one of those that, that has the uh, sea salt, but it's still common table salt, and uh, that's all we we see value in it. It has, a, you know, if we spill it, we pitch it over our left shoulder so no bad luck comes to us. Uh, that's a real godly thing to do, and. Uh, <laughs> But it's just common, ordinary, everyday salt. Why would Jesus say that about us? Because it's sodium chloride. Now, chloride is a poisonous substance, but when it adheres itself to sodium, it becomes common, ordinary, everyday table salt. Amazing. But in Jesus' day and time, they knew the value of salt. Salt... It's something of great value throughout history. The very first recorded tax in history, 2200 B.C. in China, was on salt. A salt tax. You all tax the salt, as I know. Think about it, you'll get it. <laughs> but the very first tax in history was on salt. Salt was so valuable that the Roman government paid their soldiers in salt. And according to some historians, that if a soldier shirked his duties or did not perform to what was expected, it was said of that soldier that he was not worth his salt. Now that's where that came from. There's also another theory on that as well that I won't go into. It's a little little controversial. But it wasn't worth his salt. Salt was so va valuable that it gave us words that have transcended into our society today because they paid their soldiers in salt and therefore it became known as their salary. You work every week for your salt. How about that? And we also get the word salad 
from salt because the Romans had a habit of putting salt on their leafy greens and vegetables. And therefore we have salads these days. Interesting. But probably the most fascinating word to me that comes from salt is salvation. Salvation. Could it be that Jesus Christ was looking at His disciples and said, You are the salvation of the earth. And the earth is not the terrestrial ball on which we live, but it is the people. You are the salvation of the people. Now, I know that salvation, we know that salvation is a gift of God, a gift of grace. We cannot earn it in any way, shape, form, or fashion. But if we have received salvation, are we not the tools that God uses to bring others to Jesus Christ? It's possible that Jesus was looking at His disciples and saying, you are the salvation of the earth. Now you think about this for a moment and, and compare that to salt. Jesus said, you are the salt. Salt has a, has a lot of uh, different uh, properties about it and different things that it does. But the first thing that we see that Jesus is saying is that, that, that salt is our influence. How we influence those that are around us. How we influence our, our nation. I know, I know one of our favorite scriptures, and you, I've probably said this before, and I'll say it again. One of our favorite scriptures in our society today is Jeremiah 29.11. For I know the plans I have for you, but go back and read 1 through 10, and you will find out that before he got to giving us the plans that he has for us, he tells us that we must become a part of our community and love the people and everything. In other words, we have to be salt in our community before we can understand the plans that God has for us. Nobody wants verses 1 through 10. They just want 11. But that's what taking things out of context does. You've got to understand what the whole story is. So if salt is our influence, how do we influence things? Well, you know, one of the one things that I really love is a vine ripened Arkansas tomato. And the emphasis on Arkansas, you know, you get in other states, they'll advertise Arkansas tomatoes. Something about the soil in Arkansas are just better for tomatoes. And I and uh, I'm not a fan of tomatoes, but I do like vine ripened tomatoes. These cardboard things you buy in the store or that you get in the restaurants, don't care for them. But boy, when they're vine ripened, they're worth eating. And you know, you go, nothing better in the, in the summertime is go out there and to pick one off the vine, you know, big and juicy and red and ripe. And you go in, you clean it up, and you take that knife and you slice it. Oh, yeah, well, you do that too. But you take that knife and you slice it, you put it out there on the plate, and you get that salt shaker, and you put just the right amount of salt on it, and you grab your fork, and you cut off a chunk of it, and you put that fork in, and you put it in your mouth, and, oh, man, you just start eating that, and you take that fork out, and you chew on that a minute, and you say, that is the best salt I've ever had in my life. No, you don't. It's the tomato that you brag on. But it is the salt that enhances the flavor of the tomato. And what we've got to understand before we can enhance something, before we can enhance something, we must come in contact but until the salt gets on the tomato, there is no enhancement of that flavor. We've got to get out and we've got to touch people. And I understand it's difficult at times. I understand it is because we get ourselves in our vacuums that we live in. We have a, our little uh, holy huddle that we're a part of. We are all. Uh, this is not looking at anybody. This is looking at us all as a whole because we do become victims of the immediate. There are things that demand our time that we go for and, uh, and we forget what we're really called to do. But until we can touch the lives of others, 
We cannot make a difference. We cannot enhance them the way salt does, which Jesus said we are to do because that's what salt does. And when we, uh, and I said this has got to, you know, all relate back to the, the Beatitudes. In order to touch people, we got to go back to blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. When we make other people's lives better, we're showing God's mercy and enhancing our community. When we enhance others, well, when you enhance that tomato with salt, you're not going to stop at one bite, you're going to eat more, and pretty soon you're going to have to have drink water because salt creates thirst. Jesus said, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. When we hunger and thirst after righteousness and we begin to enhance the lives of our community, people begin to get a thirst for Jesus Christ because of us. So we enhance. We create thirst. The salt also heals. You go to the hospital before they ever know what's wrong with you, before they ever know what you need, they hook you up to an IV and they start a saline solution. They start putting salt water in you because that is the first source of healing. Salt has this property that can heal for whatever reason. It just works out that way. I can't explain it. I'm not a scientist. There may be a scientist in here that can't explain it, but but not me. But I know that salt heals. And there is a broken world that is in need of healing. There are broken relationships that are in need of healing. And Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. What better way to heal that broken heart? What better way to heal those broken relationships by bringing peace of God to the individuals? To bring the peace of God to our community. And another benefit of salt is that it preserves. I am so thankful for salt and its preservation properties because we have bacon. Yeah, I got some amens there. Salt preserves. You put salt on it and it it causes it to last. And what is the salt that we are to apply that will help preserve? It is the, the, the power of God, the Holy Spirit that we receive that works in us that, that can reach out and to, can change people's lives. And the only way that we can do it is by by following Jesus Christ and and the purification process that He puts us into because He said, blessed are the pure in heart. You see, everything goes back to the Beatitudes. That's the introduction. That's the foundation of everything that Jesus is going to say to us. But we must be careful because there is a part of salt that's not good. Because salt is also caustic and corrosive. It can cause things to disintegrate if there's too much. We are supposed to be lightly salted as people of God. We're not supposed to to, uh, bear down on people, but to bear one another's burdens. Sometimes our words are condemning rather than Edifying to build up people. We got to be very careful that we do not have too much salt in us. Did you know that one ton of water from the Pacific Ocean way uh, gives us? Let me get my facts exactly correct. Gives us 79 pounds of salt in one ton of Pacific Ocean water. One ton of Atlantic Ocean water has 81 pounds of salt. Both oceans provide life. But the Dead Sea, 
one ton of water from the Dead Sea has 500 pounds of salt. And nothing can live. If we put too much salt out, we become destructive. We become corrosive. So we need to really temper our salt and gets back to blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Salt's a fascinating thing, but Jesus didn't stop at salt. He did say that if we lose our saltiness, we're no good. And I know that there's a world out there that's on a salt-free diet, so we got to get it into their diet somehow. But we are to be the salt of the earth to enhance, to create a thirst, to heal, and to preserve. But Jesus didn't stop there. He went on into light. He said, ye are the light of the world. Now light has some interesting aspects of itself. But what does Jesus mean by light? When he said, you are the light of the world, well, he meant that our light, he said that a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Because you see the light for miles. I remember the first time I ever went to Amarillo, Texas. It was in the winter time, and I was scheduled to arrive around 7 o'clock, so it would be dark. And driving across I-40 on the Texas Panhandle is a long long way and I remember when the lights of Amarillo first came into view yeah baby I see my destination and I drove and I drove and I drove and I drove (laughs) because you can see forever on that panhandle The lights of Amarillo go for 40, 50, 60 miles. You think you're there, but you're not. You've got to keep going. That's what the light on the hill is. The light on the hill is the the light that we are to be is our witness. Because people need to see us. Sometimes they have a long journey. Sometimes they're close. But we've got to be a light so they can see where their destination is, where they can find what they're looking for. It is to be our witness. From the uh, homiletic review, I I found this story, a great story. There was a a gentleman one day that was out walking in the uh, uh, east end of the city of Glasgow in Scotland. And the story tells us that the streets are so narrow and the, the, the buildings are so tall that direct sunlight is virtually impossible. And as he's walking down the streets one day, he sees this little boy sitting on the side of the road. He's got a little piece of a mirror in his hand. And he's sitting there and he's earnestly seeking out the sun and reflecting it off of that mirror. And pretty soon he figures it out. He's he's shooting it up to a window on the second story across the street. And he just watches this little boy as as he keeps trying to reflect the light of the sun into that room. And he... Finally, he got enough of his curiosity of him. He says, says, young man, what are you doing? He said, well, he says, you see that window? My little brother had an accident two years ago. And he has to lay flat on his back. And we live on the wrong side of the street for him to see the sun. And I'm just trying to give him a little bit of the sun in his room. You're the light of the world. A city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Don't hide it under a bushel. But rather let it shine for all the world to see. Because light does some things that the people are in great need of because light opens eyes. I don't know about you, but my favorite way of waking up is when the sun pops in the window. My eyes will open when it's starting to get daybreak. 
That's what light does. Now, if you have struggled in darkness, the first thing you do, your eyes open, but you can't see clear. you got to let your eyes adjust to it. And that's the way many people are. When they see the light that is shining from the church, they walk in, they don't understand. And it's not our place to, to uh, uh, judge or, or, or to legislate how they should act or how they should be. It is our place, is our place to just shine until their eyes become adjusted and they can see because the light of God will open the eyes. Jesus Christ said, um, you are the light of the world. So let your light so shine before men that they may see. And what do they see? They see your good works, which in turn glorify the Father. It's our purpose. To open eyes. But light not only opens eyes, it also eases fear. How many of you, your children or your grandchildren, had to have or had need a nightlight? Yeah, we know this well. Because when the light is off, fear creeps in because we cannot see. There is a world that is shaking in their boots. They don't know it, but they are because they cannot see the truth, which is God. We've got to promote the truth. We cannot promote ourselves. We are not here to build Oakland Church of God. We are here to build the kingdom of God and let God add to our congregation daily such as those that should be saved. We've got to get our priorities straight. We've got to remove the fear of people from walking through our doors. And they're not going to walk through our doors until we get out there and say, come and see. It's a different generation. People aren't looking for us. That's why Christ says his good shepherd seeks the lost sheep. The 99 that are safe, they're safe. Go seek and find the lost. That's what we're called to do. Light is his fear. Blessed are they that mourn. Because as we understood last week, to mourn means to understand who we truly are in the presence of God. Just like Isaiah in chapter 6 when he said, Woe is me. To mourn, there's great fear in what Isaiah is saying. When he realized that he was in the presence of a holy God and he was not holy. A great fear. Light created fear. But the light of God casts away the fear. We are afraid when we first see the light. But when we walk towards it, the fear dissipates. And light also leads the way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I learned that in the basement of the First Church of God, Hot Springs, Arkansas, corner of Parker and Hawthorne, and have never forgotten it. Psalm 27.1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Salt and light. The Lord is my light and my salt. That's what David's saying. The Lord is my light and my salvation. And He directs our paths. And as we follow in His light, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Everybody else walks in the light too. Because the light shines off of us. That's 1 John 1, uh, 7, I think. 
Yeah, it's 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. So, it shows the way. Now, I'm not saying that we need to be so holy that people follow us. We've got enough people following false prophets. I, I, I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to. Some of us need to turn off our TV preachers and get back to the local church. A lot of false teachers out there filling this world with nothingness. And we as the church needs to get back to the fundamentals of the truth of the gospel because it's the only thing that we have to offer the world is God's truth. So as I follow and walk in the light, rather than follow me, come and go with me. Come and go with me. Walk with me as we walk in the path that God has put before us. The old hymn writer of the church of God says, Along a dark and gloomy path, I bow beneath the shades of death till light from the Savior came. In the light of God, now my soul is singing, all, all is bright. In the light of God, I'm now in the light of God. And come and go with me. Paul says, Look, follow me as I follow Him. No, no, in other words, don't really follow me, but just come and go with me. What greater thing can we say because we can truly save no one, but we can get out into the community and say, come and go with me. Come and see. Come and see. Jesus Christ has something for you. Come and see. So we must take a look at ourselves. Are we salt? And are we light? Do we offer to the world what they're looking for? Can they see it in our good works? Now we know good works don't save us. The Bible's clear on that. But the Bible's also clear that if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we do good works. Show me your works, I'll show you your faith. If you truly have faith, you will do good works. That's the way it works. It's, it's heaven's public work system. <laughs> we tap in to the main source and it does good work in us and through us. We need to search our souls and our hearts individually and collectively. Are we salt and light in our community? We're at the beginning of a new year. We have opportunity before us that we know not what it is. But we can only do it together. We cannot do it separate. Our challenge to us comes from God is to let our light so shine that we enhance the flavor of our community. Where even those that don't know us know about us. And it's good. And it's pleasing. And it's tasty. Community is not saying bad things about us or saying good things about us even though they don't come in our doors to be salt and to be light. And the question is, where do we stand? Would you stand with me, please? Fathers, you speak to us. May we respond to your heart's call. In Christ's name, amen. How can they 
call on Him and let's say believe. How can they hear about Him if we never see? How will anyone go if we're not moving our feet? How can we reach the least of these? Without doing a thing The Lord, I'm reaching To the broken and the lost You love us all the same And you cover our shame By the blood of the cross I want to share your love to the world So that the lost can be found to use my hands, my feet, and every single word I speak to reach them. He's sending us out into a foreign land. With your mercy, love, and grace, it's time to take a stand. You set us all apart to be united as one. We can't give up, it's never gonna be no until your work is done. So, Lord, I'm reaching to the broken and the lost. Love us all the same and you cover our shame by the blood of the cross. I want to share your love to the world so that the law can be found. Squeeze my hands, my feet, and every single word I speak. Ease my hands, my feet, and every single word I speak. Lord. Use my hands, my feet, and every single word I speak to reach them. Thank you for your time, your attention this morning. Don't forget the announcements of the week. And uh, those of you that are on the... uh, Elders board, I want to meet with you just a second so we can set a time to meet. We didn't set a time for a meeting in January, so if I could just meet with you briefly so we can set a date to meet right after the service, I'd appreciate it very much. Go out and flavor our community this week. Go out and be a light that shines in the darkness. Yeah, let me challenge you that... uh, Whether or not they show up next Sunday or not, invite one person to church this week. Just give them a come and see. And we'll see. Sister Ruby DeBoer, would you dismiss us please?